Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at The Block, and we have a very exciting episode for you today. Hopefully, our guest lifts our spirits in the midst of this downtrodden period in which we find ourselves uh, from a price perspective and from just a everyone seems to be leaving the market perspective. Rob Payone, he's seen many different cycles throughout his time as a headhunter, uh, former podcaster, and all-around good guy. Uh, he's the CEO of Proof of Talent, which is a recruiting firm that focuses exclusively on the crypto Web3 industry. And um, he's kind of a thought leader when it comes to just the recruiting process. He's done webinars with us before. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to touch on a lot of different things. I mean, we'll, we'll hit how to get a job in crypto, what the market looks like, where these people are going, and maybe how you can help them find jobs somewhere <laughs> else. Maybe that's an opportunity. But before we dive into all of that, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Huobi, one of the world's leading virtual asset exchanges, has been providing convenient and professional virtual asset management services to more than 50 million users in more than 160 countries for nearly a decade. At Huobi, their mission is to make crypto accessible, to help you understand risks and make informed decisions to protect you and your assets. Learn more today at Huobi.com. This episode is also brought to you by Ledin. From Bitcoin and USDC savings accounts to Bitcoin-backed loans, Ledin's financial services enable you to benefit from your holdings today without selling your Bitcoin. Learn more about Ledin at Ledin.io. Ledin, where your digital assets come to life. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblock.co slash terms dash service. Once again, I'd like to welcome our guest, Jets fan Rob Payon, CEO of Proof of Talent, for joining us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. I guess maybe we can quickly go through the origin story, right? Because you kind of had a very interesting career where you were selling software at, I think it was Oracle. You started the the YouTube channel. You kind of did that full time. I'm, I'm going to run through the history. You did some stuff at AirSwap. Then I think you went back and, and doubled down on the show or on your podcast and then ultimately launched Proof of Talent yep. in the depths of the last bear cycle and... You got acquired by Pomp Shop, which was nice, but you're still relatively operating independently. Yep. Um, so what does the landscape look like now? Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's basically the exact background. I used to sell software at Oracle um, <laughs> and a couple other places, then worked at AirSwap for about a year and a half. And after I did that, I uh, started Proof of Talent and have been doing that now for three and a half years um, and went through an acquisition in uh, the summer of, of this year which has been great. Uh, it's gone smooth and you know, continue to, to operate with, with my team, which has been awesome. Uh, team has continued to grow throughout, which is great. We're now 11 people, including myself. Um, so it's been, it's been a, you know, it's been a good and interesting time for sure. Uh, especially since, since May, I think there's some, some good and some bad that we can definitely dive into because the industry has definitely gone through some challenging times for sure. Yeah, and it seems like almost every day we see a new uh, announcement of layoffs. What, what, what does that mean as a recruiter? Yeah, I mean, first, first, it's unfortunate because like you never want to see anybody losing their their job. Um, that said, it, it, when you I guess think about that, it's what are those individuals going to do, and and who is potentially looking to bring those folks aboard? Because having that crypto specific skill set, there's a lot of value there, and there certainly are still firms that are hiring. It is now, I think, also a question of are there enough companies that are hiring that can re-put those people you know, back into the industry or are they going to have to look elsewhere? Where are the bright spots in this market, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think if we think about where the biggest layoffs have been, they've been the almost crypto financial services companies, the brokers, the exchanges, but there's still... Um, a lot of venture funds raising money, backing maybe smaller startups. So 
are you seeing maybe a a shift of talent from the likes of a Coinbase to insert Web three dot YX that's building like the the next iteration of NFT marketplaces as an example? Yeah, I think you pretty much nailed it. When you think about the companies that grew the fastest. Uh, those were in the last cycle. Many of those were the ones that had the the pretty substantial and sizable layoffs, and and those I think in a lot of cases were the you know, large centralized exchanges, some of the lenders um, either that just overhired or had exposure to three AC or who, you know whatever have you. Um, that said, those companies have kind of come back down to earth in terms of headcount. They've gone through layoffs, so they've stopped hiring. But then you have, like you said, kind of this new crop of of company that is starting out, whether that is some type of web uh, web three specific startup or some of these companies that just weren't hiring as much in 2021, 2022. Those companies have now been able to I think take advantage of a really good hiring market mm. for for companies, and I think now it's it's kind of interesting to think about because now is a if you are a company that's still hiring right now. This this is a really good time for those organizations just because there is, A, there's less competition in terms of the companies you're competing against to hire those individuals. But then also, B, I think you have more talent that's on the market that is looking for those opportunities. So it's not 100% like a, a company market per se right now. It's still pretty balanced, but it is a lot more, I would say, equal than six to 12 months ago. I, it was a totally candidate-driven market of... You know, individuals really kind of naming their price and, and going wherever they wanted with multiple offers. On a scale of, um, in terms of searching for a job in this market, is it as tough as being a Lions fan <laughs> or a Jets fan or an Eagles fan? Where where would we fall right now? So I guess if if the <laughs> I, I don't want I don't even know if we can say the Jets are in the middle of the pack right now. Um, <laughs> I, I guess it would it would be a it would be a Jets fan. I think Lions are permanent misery. Jets are <laughs> Jets are misery, but I think it gets amplified because it's New York, and we're certainly not in the. If you were a job seeker, you know, the bull run was was the Eagles, and and right now we're we're not in that situation. <laughs> um, so fair enough. Let's let's get a little bit practical because we can think about trends and headier topics all day long. I think there's a lot we could reflect on, but how do you get a job in crypto? Like yeah. what is your advice um, when prospective clients come to you? I assume you work with individuals who come mm -hmm. to you as well as companies who come to you and say, we want to hire, yeah. but on the individual level, what, what advice do you give? Yeah. So I think the first thing is you really want to know what you want to do in the crypto space. And ideally if you're, if you're working inside the space right now, you've already gotten that job in, within crypto, it's it's a lot easier to transition to new roles because you have that specific experience. It is more difficult if you're coming in from outside of the industry. That said, I think you want to have some type of experience that translates well into existing roles within the space. I think the easiest transition for a lot of people are technical roles. There is a huge demand still for engineering talent, technical talent. It's It's a very logical transition. The non-technical roles can get a little bit more challenging. Um, that said, there is a, and in a good manner, there is a lot greater diversity of opportunity in terms of the non-technical positions now than there was three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. The space has grown tremendously, so it is a little bit easier to get those non-technical positions. But you really want to think about how what you're doing right now translates into a future opportunity. And if you don't have an experience that experience set that aligns with that you have to really try and build that up outside the industry i think do you think those non-technical roles are sometimes the first to get axed it it depends i think we're seeing that in in crypto in some cases as well as just in tech at large i think you see the recruiting function hr um sometimes biz dev but yeah non-technical definitely does get to tend to get axed in some cases, before uh, technical candidates, or like top salespeople or something, it's pretty. It's harder to you know judge performance in some of those non-technical roles, I guess you could say. But crypto firms are hiring less. There's many instances in which freezes have been implemented at certain companies. 
Is there a slowdown on the uh, new entrance into crypto in terms of the stripes or the visas or the uh, larger financial payments companies? Are they still hiring at the same clip? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. I think that some of those companies that have the balance sheet and the position are certainly able to kind of continue that momentum that that others don't have. So how how does one negotiate in this environment? Yep. It's probably, you know, six months ago, eight months ago, it was the heady days of uh, late 2021, and people had probably multiple offers at a time. So it was a it was a good time to be a wannabe crypto employee. Now not so much. So how do you how do you sort of negotiate in in this type of environment? Yeah, I I think that compensation is still strong for job seekers, especially ones that have solid experience. Um, you know, thinking about negotiating, so you want to you want to go in with what's going to be best for you and and try to you know, try to stick to a I would say a strong but realistic number. And I also think you want to be you want to be realistic and you want to know what is most important to you because I think there's typically variables at play. You can think about base compensation, you can think about equity and or token, uh, and what does that mean to you and and what is most important to you because sometimes you're going to have to compromise a little bit and some companies do or they might have a a base to equity or a base to token sliding scale and you might get an offer at let's say you know $150,000 but with uh 1% of for let's just say this is an early stage engineer you might get an offer for $150,000 with 1% of the company or on the flip side you might get a 200k base offer with you know 50 basis points and what is more interesting to you what matters more to you would you rather have the base would you rather have the equity or the upside and trying to know that going into it, I think, is definitely a helpful thing to think about. Um, but I would say compensation, going to the point of a company versus a candidate market, I think things, again, have, have certainly equalized. But at the same point in time, the compensation hasn't necessarily come down. Um, it's just a little bit less frenzied in some cases around the actual hiring process. From a perspective of your business, um Generally, I've heard, you know, from different companies mm -hmm. in the space that they have these candidates, they're excited, but with the market drawdown, they express this this anxiousness that they don't mm -hmm. want to join a crypto company during this market period. For the companies that you're uh, working with, flipping over to that side yep. of the table, how do you help them or how do they help themselves in convincing candidates that despite the backdrop, this is a good time to join a company? Yeah. Personally, for me, I, I try to bring up the fact that a lot of what we do here at The Block, you know, aside from like how robust the business is, it's experience that can translate into other roles if crypto were to somehow go to zero. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn a lot and you're going to get some, you know, tools in your toolbox. Um, take the risk, et cetera. But I'm curious what the conversations look like on your side. Yeah, I think it's it's good information that should be portrayed from the company, whether that is a hiring manager specifically or like the C-level if it's a smaller company. But I think it's really worth talking to the candidate that is looking for that opportunity about the plan of action really for the company and just bringing transparency into the mix and, and talking about, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the exact specific financial position or the, the run rate you have or the profitability or anything along those lines, but you want to talk to them and just be realistic. And I think most of the time people appreciate that. It's just being realistic and saying, yes, things aren't great right now. We do have you know, this amount of runway or we are currently profitable and, and able to sustain operations at this level for X, Y, Z and, and just acknowledging it and and showing that you do have a plan for that because if you don't people aren't stupid like they know things aren't perfect right now so i think you want to acknowledge it and then you want to talk about how you're addressing it because as as a as a hiring manager or a company you should have a plan to address it so just having that transparency and is these important. are some of the questions that 
folks looking for a job should be asking of that hiring manager. Oh, oh, absolutely. And I think too, like if you are looking for an opportunity, I think that is absolutely something, especially now that you want to, to think about. And I also think it's good to think about the management experience and, and how they have dealt with the situation thus far. What do they talk about maybe externally? Do they talk about aggressive hiring? Do they talk about kind of sustainable approaches? Have they been in the industry for a while, even if they're not even if they haven't been with this company or this company is relatively new, have they experienced these cycles before? Because I think there is value in experiencing an 80 or 90% drawdown on, on the industry and seeing how that affects things and not you know, looking at everything through these just kind of you know bull market glasses. Even though we're not in a bull market, I think you or one of your colleagues tweeted out the other day that um, – the, the base salary for your mm. average placement is still above 200,000 or it's a, it's 197 K right 197 now for, for, 22, K. Uh, for our 2022 placements. Correct. So on the whole, if you, if you take every job that you've placed and averaged out the base, it's 197. Correct. And where, where does that compare to maybe the year before the year before was 155. So, Part part of that is is due to just us moving up market a little bit in okay. terms of some of the you know, working on a few more C level type placements. That said, we have seen just kind of continued strong hiring for like our bread and butter. I would say is these like senior level individual contributors, whether it's a senior engineer or a product manager or a senior marketing manager, somebody along those lines. So that that type of of candidate or that type of of profile those individuals you know we're often seeing kind of making between 150 and 250 thousand dollars depending upon previous experience and the company that's hiring them size of them etc and how do the maybe like top end um packages resemble or not resemble silicon valley because i know coinbase for instance and and other companies um, kind of have that leveling mm-hmm. system, which is what, what you'd find at a, a block or a or a Google. Is it is it a, is it similar in that respect? For the the size of company that we typically work with, like we're usually working with, I would say C to Series B type companies, and I would say that the compensation is is strong, especially on the engineering side, but in general is as strong as you know as from the 197k average base. That said. There's not always as much structure as there is at the the upper levels of the industry, like the Coinbase's or the Robin Hoods or you know those types of companies. I, like if you're a 50 person startup in in the in the crypto industry, you're probably not going to be paying the exact you know, the exact pay raise range as as Google with you know their L4 engineer what have you. But you get those tokens, those sweet sweet tokens. <laughs> You you do either get typically you're going to either get equity or tokens or maybe some combination of the both and uh, we see that you know pretty much every single time. Wobi, one of the world's leading virtual asset exchanges, has been providing convenient and professional virtual asset services to more than 50 million users in more than 160 countries for nearly a decade. At Wobi, their mission is to make crypto accessible, building the go-to hub for the next billion crypto users. Wobi believes crypto shouldn't have any barriers to entry. Wobi is committed to asset and platform security to help you understand risks and make informed decisions to protect you and and your assets. Learn more today at Wobi.com. I also want to give a shout out to Ledin. Ledin, Bitcoin back loans and savings by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. As we've seen, not all digital asset lenders are created equal. Ledin prioritizes safeguarding clients' assets with its robust risk management approach. That is why Ledin doesn't actively trade or invest in DeFi yield generation strategies with its clients' assets and only supports Bitcoin and USDC two of the highest quality and most liquid assets in the industry. Ledin is also dedicated to transparency, which is why they are the first digital asset lending company to complete a proof of reserves attestation. Learn more about Ledin at ledin.io. Ledin, where your digital assets come to life. Are there any weird things happening with, with token packages? 
I, I don't even know um, like what that could look like. Venture investors are thinking about mm. token deals differently. I wonder if maybe the comp packages end up looking differently in terms of vesting or maybe um, y- you get more liquidity. Mm. Most, I mean, most of the time what we see with these companies with the equity versus token is uh, with tokens, typically you're going to see a pretty similar four-year uh, vesting cycle with usually a one-year cliff. And then it either vests you know, monthly, quarterly, or annually post that one year. So pretty similar to what you would see with with equity. I think the one big upside for a lot of these individuals is that the tokens are liquid. I mean, especially with the advent of decentralized exchanges, like your token, for the most part, unless you're working at some L1 blockchain that hasn't launched, you're going to be able to sell those tokens and get liquidity the second they vest, which to me is actually a huge value in comparison. Like we can, you can debate the legality and the usefulness of tokens all you want and go for it. But that said, when you think about equity in the industry, there are a lot of great companies in the industry and a lot of people have had early stage equity at these companies. And Coinbase is probably the one biggest exit outside of that. You can probably count them on one hand, how many have really turned out to be a positive versus yeah. what would have happened with, with, with tokens. And and so many of them are trying to have that liquidity event and it keeps getting pushed or the market dynamic landscape changes. Coin it gets pushed and pushed and pushed. Pushed and pushed <laughs> and pushed. Got to – our heart goes out to our friends at Circle. I think they're going to be okay. Well, they're probably – they're the only ones that are really hiring in mass right now. I mean, did, uh, did you know they were over 900 people? Circle is – and and I don't – have any working relationship with circle but one of the crazier comeback stories i think of the last bear market i remember talking to a few engineers from there that were thinking about leaving at one point in time and just what has happened with usdc and the impact that that's had on circle and just especially now i guess with rates where they are i'm sure circle is printing money which is good for them um they deserve it after sticking around for so long so yeah well, we're 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 actually going to have him in to do like a uh, Jeremy Allaire to do a kind of entrepreneurial, more like career story Q and A for the folks here internally at the block as part of our you know the culture stuff. Like when you scale to a certain size, you have to. You, it's not just it's not like you can get all the ten dudes in a room and you know have a beer. You're you're disparate. There's people in different countries. There's people on different teams that, although they work at the same company, they're doing vastly different things. And there comes a point where you have to kind of you have to work to create a culture or to keep that culture in place. Um, and yeah. I, I don't know what the inflection point of that is. Maybe it's like fifty people or or forty people or eighty people. But I'm, I'm at eleven right now, and I feel that. So. Yeah. <laughs> so a challenge. Do you? How do you see that? Um, is that something that candidates ask about? Yeah, I think that there's, especially because I think that there's kind of two or maybe three different buckets when it comes to candidates and also companies. You have some companies that post COVID are totally remote and you know don't care where people are. Some companies have a an office but do not require people to come into it. And then you have companies that have. You know, basically gone through COVID, not enjoyed working remotely, and are now like doubling, tripling down in the office, investing a lot in in an office and bringing people in. So I think you have a very different type of culture with each one of those companies. And as an individual or a candidate, I think you really just want to know which one is is kind of the best for you, especially as a candidate. And as, as a company, you just you always want to have clear communication as to whether or not you are you know remote first or remote only or in office only. And when you're a candidate, like you should know which one of those jobs that you really want because especially after the past few years of people working, you know, some people working in an office, some pe- a lot of people working remotely. You probably know at this point in time which one you prefer and which one you'd like to do. Do you think it's a an impossible task to be both? Do you think companies need to pick to some extent? Um, a little bit. I think that it's not as much an issue in crypto. I Where I see a lot of these issues is in the traditional world where you have all these big companies that are 
you know, going go, everybody back in the office. And then there's a new wave of COVID, and then okay, we're we're remote again. People in in crypto, I think, for the most part of the companies in crypto, have been pretty clear as to you know we're we're remote or we are back in the office, and there hasn't been a lot of of issue with that. So I think as long as as long as an organization is just not flip flopping, because you I think you get a lot of situations where people will move to a different state or you know do basically used to have an office in New York and now somebody wants to move to California or to Florida or wherever. And then all of a sudden you have to be back in the office again and somebody's in a different state. It's not really going to work too well. Yeah, that's fair. Well, maybe thinking about maybe some of the younger folks who you probably don't engage with directly, but I'm sure. Talk to you a decent amount. Talk to you, but companies still need to hire, you know, younger folks. And I'm sure many of them are are listening because they want to get a job versus the usual listeners who are, already in crypto because this is about, you know, getting a job in, in, in the ecosystem and um, navigating the hiring landscape for, you know, people right out of college wanting to work at a crypto company. What is the advice that you'd give them? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a good question. I think it's, it's definitely harder for a recent grad to get into crypto just for, I would say, the reason being that a lot of these smaller to mid-sized companies, as they're getting traction, are trying to hire people that have professional experience so that they don't have to train them as much because they don't have the traditional training programs that a larger company would have. Um, that said, I think the advice that I would give is to try and look for kind of the more medium to large size companies that do have that infrastructure that allows for training versus maybe looking at the a really small five, 10 person startup, they might be able to hire you. And that's mm-hmm. true. However, I think you're probably going to have more luck if you look up market because, you know, for example, and maybe not the best example, but something like Coinbase used to hire engineers in large graduate classes. Like most startups aren't doing that mm-hmm. um, or early stage startups aren't doing that. And the same thing can be said for a lot of the other kind of medium to large size companies in the space. So looking to... 2023 i mean do you see hiring slipping have we have we hit a floor there and how much of of it is tied to price and if it's tied to price by a large degree then you probably have no idea because none of us know <laughs> where this is going to go it, it feels like we've hit a floor yeah late may june july we're not the best times to be recruiting in crypto it was a time in which there was a lot of layoffs and then there were also a lot of companies that were and kind of in the midst of figuring out, hey, we're just going to stop hiring in in total, we were able to pivot pretty quickly and kind of readjust to work with new companies that were indeed hiring in the crypto space. And August, September, October uh, have been really good months for us. So that's been you know that's been great. That said, I do think that the hiring market in crypto has and and will continue to kind of lag the price of of you know, Bitcoin and just the other crypto assets. A lot of that, in part, is due to just volume and kind of how a lot of the industry generates revenue. It's based upon speculation. It's based upon trading fees and, and things like that. So there is a lot of, of revenue that gets generated when that happens. You know, there's more hiring in the space and, and things like that. So is there, at least through your experience, is there a good way to do layoffs and a bad way to do layoffs? Like, is there a way that you would advise a company to sort of execute layoffs in this market? You know, What's the good, bad, and ugly in that respect? Yeah, I think with layoffs, it's just leadership being human and transparent is usually the way to to go because there are a lot of examples. And I would say it's maybe been less in, in crypto and more just general tech where you hear these examples of, especially large companies that have like a remote workforce, but all of a sudden it's 100 people invited to a Zoom. They don't have speaker access yeah. or whatever, and you're just... That fired. was better, wasn't it? I it was so. it was yep. that real estate or um mortgage mortgage company, company that just the guy <laughs> he like fake cried and kind of, you know, dabbed a bone eye and bone dry eye and said, You guys are you guys are gone. Yeah. And and so I think like something like that, and I think there were there were some some comments that the CEO made that were not 
well received by the press. So a, you want to stay out of the press for just not being <laughs> good at, at doing a layoff. So do what you can to to not <laughs> to not end up like better. Um, but then in addition, and and I don't know about the financial package that you can offer, but there have been some companies that have offered pretty generous financial packages for the people that have been laid off. I don't recall Coinbase's exact package, but they like getting laid off by Coinbase probably wasn't the worst thing in the world because you got paid pretty well for it was maybe three or six months I plus think a lot like of that, yeah. it was like they don't have to do that and doing that yet it's it's terrible to get laid off and it's not great but you basically get a three to six month either vacation or very early start in your job search and you get paid a few months double up so and it's smart i don't know about you but i know of you know not not a ton but a handful of senior people who hmm were part of a layoff in the last cycle who ended up actually working again at that same company three years, two years later. Yeah. So you don't want to, you don't want to completely um, don't become a bridges. pariah and yep. burn bridges. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just treating people with respect because especially when you are building that company and having that, you just, you want to make sure that you take care of those people. Respect is really important. So we, we kind of looked at how a company can be respectful in layoffs. How do you see maybe, I'm sure you deal with some serious egos, how can job seekers go through the process in a mature, respectful way? You know, I don't want to get into the generational elements that, sure. that underpin a lot of these conversations, but you hear with younger folks about ghosting and kind of, you know, even when I hear about younger entrepreneurs, like not having a proper deck or um, not sort of, you know, showing up to the interview in shorts, like mm -hmm. in this post COVID crypto world, like what elements of, of reverence, if you will, or um, decorum should you still bring to the job hunting process as a individual? And then, Maybe even as a company, yep. you know, if we're not talking about layoffs, we're talking about job seeking. Like, I've heard a lot of like messy stuff happen mm. on the employer side where they're, you know, I've heard of a of one company send, "I'm sorry, you are rejected for this position," only to have the recruiter reach out an hour later saying, "Can we get time in your calendar?" Mm. And it's like that was kind of during the go go times where these recruiters are probably up to their their eyes and in, in, in deliverables, but um, without sort of going on a, a tangent here, what are the, what are the do's and don'ts, I guess, in terms of like being respectful for the individual and then for the maybe internal recruiter or the company itself throughout that hiring process? Yeah. I would say on both sides, kind of going back to it, don't burn bridges. It's a small industry and I think people talk both candidates and companies. So if you are a, Somehow, if you're just disrespectful or just not an enjoyable person to work with, yeah, in the like what process, gets people talking? Like, what would get some, you know, what would get people sort of telling their network, hey, this guy in this process? Frankly, we we don't see a lot of super, I would say, like negative attitude on on behalf of candidates. Um, you know, every once in a while, somebody's going to get going to get a counter offer from a company that they're at. Happened recently, and they're going to turn down the offer that they accepted, and they're going to go back to the company or they might drag along a process because they have a couple other interviews that they want to you know, see through. But you know, as long as I feel like as long as you're roughly transparent in terms of what you have going on, like you certainly as a candidate, if you're interviewing at five different places, you don't have to tell the company or tell the recruiter you're working with, I'm interviewing at these exact places. But you should just say, hey, I, I have these interviews going on, timing is of the essence. And Keep keep people in the loop on that front. Yeah. So how would you how would you phrase that in the in the best way to be transparent but not give up too much of your hand? Just say you know I have other opportunities that I'm I'm looking at and hopefully this will fit within this time frame. Yeah, I, I think that's roughly correct, and I think that's kind of more important towards the middle to latter stages of an interview process. In the early stage, it's probably not the biggest deal. Uh, but definitely saying that in kind of the, the mid to late stage of, of the process is, is important. And I think that, frankly, an area that we see probably the, the biggest issue with sometimes is just companies moving slowly. 
even now, uh, I think it's really critical to, as an organization, have a time efficient and organized hiring process because you're going to lose out on good talent. And as an organization, you want to think about like, do I actually want to hire this individual? And if you do, you should move. Yes, you should. You don't have to hire somebody in three days, but when you are going through a process, you should give them accurate time date. You know, you should give them accurate dates. You should give them feedback. And if it's not somebody that you want to move forward with, then make that decision and let that candidate go out of the process so that they can continue on with their lives and, and go in another direction. And there is a point at which fast is too fast. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and you want to, I'm sure everybody's interviewed for a job at some point in their life where you don't want to feel rushed yeah. and you don't want to interview at a company on Monday and have them give you an offer on Tuesday and be like, hey, I want you to come work here on Wednesday because you haven't had enough time to to vet that opportunity. It's sus, as the kids would say. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> as in suspect, right? I don't know. You're you're up on your Zoomer. You're a Zoomer. Uh, no, I'm not. I, I missed the cutoff, which uh, I feel like there's a bigger generational divide between Zoomers and millennials than there is millennials and Gen X, in my opinion. These Zoomers, I don't know what they're doing. I feel like they don't even like apply for jobs. They're just TikToking and and taking pictures of like weird food. I just kind of feel like time is a flat circle and it's just every generation that comes out next is is the the new thing. I remember reading speaking of your former uh former employer back in the day like Business Insider articles in 2012 that were talking about how unique millennials were and had how you had to cater to them in the workplace and how they wanted different things than previous generations. And now like, you see the same articles about, you know, Zoomers. But do they really? I mean, this is kind of what we were getting to before about like these weird um, cultural questions. Uh, is it is it that different? Like, don't people don't just so. want the same stuff? Which it's, is it's it's. I feel like it's the joke of just people saying eventually now it's ten years ago is millennials didn't want to buy houses or millennials couldn't afford to buy houses and now you see the articles of. Millennials are moving to the suburbs. It's like it's the circle of life, basically. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but there's so many of those articles in the press that talk about how to get a job, how not to get a job, and they sometimes do seem a bit tone deaf. Yeah, they. they I think you know, making generalizations on people is usually not the way to go. <laughs> yeah, and and speaking in absolutes is not the way to go. So everybody's an individual. Yeah, and I'm sure you see that shine through all these different hiring processes. Yeah, and it, again, I think it just goes back to you know, being respectful, being time efficient, and on on both sides of the house too. I think that's always if you're a candidate and you're interviewing, and you get an offer, don't drag it out three weeks. So, so I want to close out with something that you've talked about, like since I've met you, or rather since you began doing this, which is. You don't need to be like a crypto savant to get a job in crypto. And I think that was true three years ago and it's true now, but you do need to have some basics. I remember, um, you know, even when I was at Business Insider, like I would do a lot of these career um, related young Wall Street stories. And I interviewed this one guy and um, about the the do's and, and don't do's about applying for a job in an investment bank. And he goes, well, at least just know what an investment bank does to an extent. <laughs> know what the business does. Yep. You don't need to be an expert on on everything that underpins finance, but know that as an investment bank, we're advising clients on on mergers or acquisitions or on their own investments, but we're not picking stocks. That's not what we do. Yep. Um, that's the baseline. Is there a baseline for crypto in terms of yeah. what you should know? Do you need to know when pizza day is? <laughs> do you need to know when... When do you need to know who Frank Chaparro is? Uh, well, the person in the airport did not know who you were. Uh, I know, but I I had another guy at the airport uh, two weeks later stop me after I was getting out of security, but he stopped me. And he goes, "Are you Frank?" And I was like, "Yeah." I was like, "Victory." I'm back. I'm back. That baby. was embarrassing, though. That tweet got like the... that was that was the best tweet ever. I <laughs> I, I laughed a lot about that tweet. <laughs> But uh, getting back to the question, so I would say that if you are interested in an opportunity in the crypto space, you don't have to be an expert by any stretch. That said, I think you want to be able to speak intelligently on at least like one topic. And it doesn't 
it doesn't have to be anything specific, but I, I think you want to be able to show a depth of knowledge in something where it could be NFTs, it could be some type of DeFi thing, it could be Bitcoin, it could be Ethereum, like whatever you are interested in, you should be able to speak intelligently on it. When, when I think something is not enough is when you're somebody and you go into an interview process, they will likely ask you about your background or your interest in the industry. And when you say, hey, you know, I bought XRP in 2017 and you know, traded it for a three X or something like that. That's not a, a really great answer. You want to be able to talk accurately about whatever it is that you like in the space to where you could have a 10 or 15 minute conversation with a hiring manager about why you like that topic. It's almost like don't talk about your trading. I think that's probably not the best thing to, to bring up, especially in an interview. I mean, if it comes up at some point in time, sure. But I would stick to more topic focused things and I would say, hey, I flipped this NFT for a 5X or something yeah, along those yeah. lines. Well, Rob, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Once again, we've been joined by our guest, Rob Payone, CEO of Proof of Talent. Where can our listeners learn more about you and what you're working on? Yeah, you can reach out to me on Twitter uh, if you'd like. It's at crypto underscore Bobby or the Proof of Talent website, proofoftalent.co. You can always reach out to me there as well and, and the rest of my team if you're looking for a role in crypto or if you're hiring. Yeah, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of people DMing you for that $197,000 job that's would, out Would there. love to help you get a $197,000 job or preferably more. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have an awesome day. Looking for more great insights from The Block? Check out The Block Research, the premier platform for research content on crypto markets and the digital asset industry. The Block Research membership includes cutting-edge reports, webinars, company maps, and more, available via our dedicated research portal. Visit theblockresearch.com to find out how to join today or contact a member of our sales team at sales at theblockcrypto.com and let them know that Frank sent you.